In session 29 of this 36 session corporate finance class, I'd like to introduce the basics of valuation. First talking about different ways you can approach valuation and then talking about the drivers of value, cash flows, growth rates, risk, and when your company might become a mature company. We're into the final stretch here. And what I'd like to talk about in these last few sessions is how everything we've talked about in the context of corporate finance ties to the value of the business. The reason again is very simple. The objective in corporate finance is to maximize the value of your business, right? So everything we've talked about, the investment decision, the financing decision, the dividend decision has to show up somewhere in value. So to set the table on valuation, let me first go back to the original big picture. Your objective is to maximize the value of the business. Everything feeds into that process. Let's think about what drives value. To think about value, let me suggest to you that the three ways, and only three ways, or three approaches to estimating value. The first is what I'm going to call intrinsic valuation. Sounds fancy, but here's what it is. The value of an asset in the intrinsic value approach is the value of its fundamentals, cash flows, growth, and risk. So to value an asset, you need to look at its fundamentals. You need to make, base your valuation on those fundamentals. The second approach to valuation, I should really not call valuation, it's pricing. But I'm going to call it relative valuation. In relative valuation, the value of an asset is based on how similar assets are priced out there. Keyword is similar. Of course, similar is subjective. But think about what you do when you buy a house. When you think about how much you pay for a house, you don't do an intrinsic valuation of the house. You look at what other houses in the neighborhood sold for, and you base what you pay on, on those other houses' prices. That's what relative valuation does. You value a company based on similar companies, or you value an asset based on how similar assets are being priced by the market. There's a third approach to valuation that's used relatively infrequently. Basically, it's using option pricing models, which have become popular in finance, to value certain kinds of assets. What kinds of assets? If the value of your asset is contingent on something happening, let me give you a couple of examples. A young biotechnology company with a blockbuster drug working its way through the FDA pipeline. The contingency there is the FDA has got to approve the drug, and the drug has to become a, a blockbuster drug. That company could be worth a lot if those contingencies occur. Here's the second example. You have an oil company with a lot of undeveloped reserves. Those undeveloped reserves could have value if oil prices stay high or could be worthless if they drop. Those are contingent assets, and in those cases, an option pricing model may help you value those assets. This is what falls under the rubric of real options. So basically, there are three approaches, intrinsic valuation, relative valuation, and real options. Let's start by looking at the big picture of intrinsic valuation. It's easy to get lost in spreadsheets and models when you do valuation. But as I see it, here are your four basic tasks when you do an intrinsic valuation. The first is to assess what your existing assets are generating as cash flows. And that might often come from looking at existing financial statements. So you have investments you've already made. Remember those assets in place. I'm looking at what those cash flows are, and I'm trying to attach a value to those cash flows. That should be relatively straightforward. Here's the tough part. The second assessment you've got to make is assess the value of growth. Not all growth is valuable. In fact, growth can have zero value. It can actually destroy value. To see why, think about the trade-off. Growth is good in the sense it makes your earnings larger in the future, right? But to grow, you have to set aside money right now. So you give up some cash flows today. If you give up more than you get back, growth destroys value. But if you gain more as growth than you, put, than you give up in terms of cash flows, growth has value. So one of the big tasks you face in assessing the value of growth is, is this good growth, bad growth, or neutral growth? You have to make that judgment. Not easy to do, but it's, it's, de it's definitely part of your job as intrinsic valuation. The third job is assessing how risky these cash flows are and trying to bring them into the discount rate. We've, in a sense, laid the foundations for doing that already in corporate finance because we've talked about how to measure risk in equity, how to measure risk in debt, and how to bring them all into a cost of capital. You might, not or might not, you might or might not agree with those approaches, but all of those approaches are designed to bring risk into the discount rate. And there's a final judgment you have to make, at least in theory. Many publicly traded companies can last forever. They don't, but in theory, they could. You cannot estimate cash flows forever. So you have to make an assumption about what to do after a certain time period. 
three years, five years, when you stop estimating cash flows. The way you put closure in an intrinsic valuation is by assuming that at some point in time, your company will become a mature company, a company that grows at a stable growth rate forever. I call this steady state. When will that happen? Well, it depends on the company. If you're looking at ExxonMobil, it might already be here. Your company's already a mature company growing at a rate less than or equal to the economy. That's, in a sense, a growth rate you will need to assume if you assume a growth rate forever. If you're looking at a company like Facebook, that could be 10 years out. So with high growth companies, it could be a long time into the future. With mature companies, it could be today. So what are your cash flows from existing assets? What's the value of growth? How risky are your cash flows? When will you be in steady state? That's the way I think about valuation because those inputs feed into the valuation equation. And in the valuation equation, here's what you need to do. You first need to make a judgment on what you're doing in valuation. Here's what I mean by that. Remember that financial balance sheet? You have assets on one side, debt and equity in the other. You can either value just the equity in a business or value the entire business. Let me explain the difference. When you're focused on just valuing equity, all you care about are the equity investors. You look at the cash flows they get from the business, which is cash flows left over after debt payments, and you did discount those cash flows at the rate of return equity investors need to make to break even on that equity investment. We call that the cost of equity in corporate finance. We'll continue to call it the cost of equity here. You discount cash flows to equity at the cost of equity. You have the value of equity in a business. Now, if this is a publicly traded company, one very strict view of the world says that the only cash flow you get as an equity investor from the company is dividends. The dividend discount model is a special case of an equity valuation model. But in equity valuation, you stay focused on equity. You look at their cash flows, you look at their rate of return, the cost of equity, you come up with the value of equity in a business. Here's the alternative. Rather than valuing just the equity in the business, you can value the entire business. To see the distinction, here's the way to think about it. When you run a business, you can get money from equity investors. You can also borrow money. Equity investors get their cash flows, cash flows to equity, which are residual cash flows. Lenders to the firm get their cash flows, interest payments and principal payments. The collective cash flow you get as a business, in this case, goes to both equity investors and lenders. That collective cash flow is called the cash flow to the firm. Another way to think about this cash flow, it's the pre-debt cash flow. It's a cash flow before debt payments. If that is the cash flow you're discounting, though, the discount rate applied to that cash flow can no longer be the cost of equity. It's got to be a weighted average of what the equity investors want, which is the cost of equity, and what lenders demand, which is the cost of debt, which, of course, is our definition of the cost of capital. Cash flows to the firm, discounted back at the cost of capital, gives you the value of the entire firm. Now, can you still get back to equity? Sure. All you need to do is subtract out the debt from the value of the firm. You'll end up with the value of equity in the business. The key, though, is to be consistent. What gets people into trouble is moving back and forth between equity valuation and firm valuation. Now, if you ask me which one should I use when I value a company, if you do it right, you should get the same value of equity, whether you value directly by taking cash flows to equity and discounting at the cost of equity, or valuing the business and subtracting our debt. But doing it right is really tough to do. So often you have to make a choice up front as to which path you're going to adopt. And here's a very simple rule to follow. Be pragmatic. If your debt ratio is stable over time, in other words, you expect it to be 20% a year forever, then you're okay using firm valuation. At the extreme, though, if you cannot estimate cash flows at all, you throw up your hands after a while, then you have no choice but to use dividends. In fact, I'm going to use dividends in 2007 to value Deutsche Bank. Why? Because, in a sense, I really can't estimate cash flows, or I didn't even try in 2007. If the debt ratio is stable, then estimating free cash flow equity becomes easier, right? Remember earlier in our discussion of free cash flow equity in the context of dividend policy, I gave you the shortcut, where if you are willing to assume a stable debt ratio, I said getting the free cash flow equity is much easier to do. In that case, discounting free cash flow equity at the cost of equity actually is a much more direct way to, to valuing equity. So I'm actually going to value Tata Motors using a free cash flow equity model. I'm going to value the equity in Tata Motors because I'm pretty comfortable that their debt ratio is not going to change. For Vale and Disney, though, I expect the debt ratios to change over time. And because I expect the debt ratios to change over time, I'm going to take the pragmatic route, and here's why. Estimating cash flows to equity when the debt ratio cha changes is a pain in the neck because you've got to estimate debt repayments and new debt issues 
but adjusting the cost to capital for changing debt ratios is easy to do. So when the debt ratio changes, it's usually easier to value the entire business than to value equity. And for, for both Vale and Disney, I'm going to use firm valuation because I expect the debt ratio to change. Finally, for Baidu, where I'm not certain what's going to happen in the future, I'm going to stick with valuing the entire business because if I'm not sure what will happen in the future, I don't want to assume that my debt ratio will stay stable over time. So which one you do, there's no right or wrong answer. There are easier and more difficult answers. Hopefully, this will give you a pathway as to which approach you should use. Just as a kind of over, uh, an overview, 80% of the companies I value, I value the entire business and back into equity. One in five cases, I use an equity valuation. So valuing the business is usually a more generic, general approach than valuing the equity in the business. So let's step back and think about why that choice matters so much. When I think about the inputs into valuation, here are the four basic inputs, and they mirror what we talked about in terms of the drivers of value. The first, of course, is what did you generate as cash flows in your most recent year? Now, let's play, let's play a game. Let's assume you first take on the role of somebody valuing equity in a company. And I asked you that question. What were your cash flows last year? The cash flows you should be giving me are cash flows after debt payments, cash flows after interest payments and principal payments. And that should be the cash flow to equity. If, on the other hand, you're valuing the business, the cash flow you should give me when I ask you what the cash flow was should be a pre-debt cash flow before debt payments, before interest and principal payments. So already you can see that your cash flow definitions are going to be different depending on whether you are the equity hat or the firm hat. Then I'm going to ask you, what's the growth rate going to be in the future? If you're valuing equity, the growth rate you should be talking about is a growth rate in equity income, net income, earnings per share. Whereas if you're talking about valuing the entire business, the growth rate you should be talking about is growth rate in operating income, the earnings before interest in taxes. Then I ask you, how risky are these cash flows? Again, wearing your equity hat, the risk you should be talking about is the risk in equity and the cost of equity. Whereas if you're talking about valuing the business, the risk you're talking about is the risk in the business and the cost of capital. The final question, though, is a far simpler one. When will your company be a mature company? That answer should be the same, whether you're doing an equity valuation or a firm valuation. But you can already see why making this choice early is critical. You need to make a judgment early on as to whether you're valuing equity of the business because every single input into valuation will be driven by that choice you make. So as a closing slide to this particular session, let me talk about something bigger. All too often when people talk about valuation or think about valuation, they think about, think about models and spreadsheets where they put numbers into a spreadsheet to come up with value. There's a lot of number crunching in valuation. In fact, you can divide the world of investing into two camps. There are the number crunchers who sit on their mountaintop and grind out spreadsheets and models and think that numbers are the answer to everything. And in the other mountaintop are the storytellers who think that they never have to talk about a number because they've got some really good stories. Here's how I think about value. Valuation, a good valuation, is a bridge between stories and numbers. So when I do a valuation, if you point it to a number, there should always be a story behind the number. And if you tell me a story, there should always be a number matching up to the story. That takes some doing, because in a sense, each group has its own strengths. And to make that, that span across numbers a narrative, and I, I think of stories as narrative, you need to understand both groups of investors. So to me, evaluation is never all, entirely about the numbers, and evaluation is never entirely about the storytelling. It's about bridging that gap that allows me to make that link between your stories and the numbers that go with those stories. So that's basically what we're gonna to try to do in these next few sessions, is to try to bring the numbers in with the intent of making stories come, th come through into evaluation. Thank you very much for listening.